All right, so in this video, let's talk about Edgeworth bugs. Um, before going through Edgeworth bugs, let's remember the uh, model specific assumptions we had in the general equilibrium. Uh, we had two agents, remember, we call them A and B. We had two goods, we call them good one and good two. Um, what we have is the initial endowment, which is WA, WB. These are vectors of vectors. So how many good one, good two each agent brings? Um, well, we have the allocations. X, remember how many good A and good B uh, the agents consume. Think it that way. What else? Uh, the utility functions. Uh, utility function for agent A and utility function for agent B. So those utility function functions represent their preferences. We assume that each agent uh, gets utility only from his or her consumption of good one and good two. Okay, so uh, agent A does not get any utility out of good one or good two agent B consumes. So th these are functions of X1A, X2. So UA is XA. UA is a function of XA1 and XA2. All right. So what we would like to do in the Edgeworth box, um, we, we like to uh, draw the indifference curves of these agents on the same picture. So that's the purpose. Uh, but we know that um, so in the classic uh, demand theory, uh, we have uh, agent A, uh, we put his consumption of good one and good two on the horizontal and the vertical axis, and then we drove the indifference curves. And then we can drive, uh, drove the indifference curves for agent B, his, her consumption of good one, her consumption of good two, and then her indifference curves, assuming that she has, for example, Cobb Douglas utility functions. Um, so this is for agent A of good one, this is agent A of good two, this is agent B of good one, this is agent B of good two, obviously. But again, drawing these um, indifference curves separately is not helpful for the arguments that we will make later, all right? Uh, like Pareto efficiency, uh, Walras in equilibrium, and so on. So we like to bring them together. So how do, I, how do we do that? Given the initial endowments, first calculate the total number of goods the agents uh, bring to the market. So we call, well, the, the good one, agent A brings this many and agent B brings this many. So this is total number of good one. And for good two, agent A brings this many plus agent B brings this many. So this is how many good one, and this is how many good two available the agents bring to the market. So then uh, what we draw is sort of a similar to this. Uh, on the one axis, we're gonna have good one. On the other axis, we're gonna have good two. But the good one is going to be basically, so it's gonna create us a, a box, so. The sizes depends on uh, these two sums. Okay, so this is basically WA1 plus WB1, so the total number of good one, and the height is WA2 plus WB2. Again, so the horizontal axis is good one, total number of good one, the vertical axis is total number of good two. What happens is that every allocation, oh, okay, I'll come to that. So what happens is that, um, well, I mean, why do I have to draw this as a box rather than just one agent X1 versus X2 thing? Well, here's the thing. We put agent A to this corner and so basically this is zero, zero point for agent A. And then we, in a sense, flip this curve and therefore put agent B to this corner. And this is zero, zero point for agent B. 
All right, so what does that mean? That means, uh, so this, for example, point indicates zero good one and one unit of good two for agent A. This is two unit of good two, three unit of good two, all of which has zero unit of good one, and so on. Okay, so this indicates one unit of good one. So this point indicates one unit of good one and zero unit of good two for agent A and two units of good one, zero units of good two, three, four, and so on. All right, so if you think a point here, all right, so if you pick a point here, well, this is going to, so let's call this X. So this X basically has two units for good one and two units for good two for agent A. So this is X A1 and this is X A2. But you can also interpret this allocation from agent B's perspective. Well, so this is how many good one agent B has, and this is how many good two agent B has. Okay, so remember the feasibility means the total number of good one available for agent A, uh, not available, I'm sorry, agent A consumes and the total number of good one agent B consumes must add up to total number of available endowments, which is this. And similarly, total number of good two agent A consumes plus total number of good two agent B consumes must be equal to the total number of available or the endowment for good two. So therefore this point X also, so this is XA, but it also the XB component, when you look at from the agent B's perspective, well, the number of good one is basically uh, W a1 plus wb1 minus 2 and then the <clears throat> wa2 plus wb2 minus 2 all right oh, i'm sorry um, I, I didn't want to uh, cross this a so so this x allocation therefore in a sense has four coordinates the first two uh, represents the good one and good two uh, consumption for agent A and the last two um, coordinates tell us about agent B's consumption of good one and good two. All right, so every point in this allocation, uh, I'm sorry, in the edge work box is therefore feasible. All right, so let me repeat every allocation in the edge work box is feasible and all the feasible allocations must be in the edge work box. So any, if, you, if you think about any allocation outside of the edge work box is going to be non-feasible, all right? Okay, so once again, anything outside of the edge work box is therefore not feasible and every feasible allocation is in the edge work box, all right? So the final point that I should mention is the indifference curve. So how do we put the indifference curves on the edge work box? How do we place them, I mean? Well, simple. So let me open up some space here. The agent A's indifference curves, again, let's assume that these indifference curves have those nice shapes. So agent, indif uh, agent A's indifference curves are going to move in this space, in this fashion. So as we move away from the origin point for agent A, it means higher indifference curves, and it means agent A is getting happier and happier and happier and happier. Well, symmetrically, agent B's indifference curves, so remember this is, we're flipping this, all right? And so her indifference curves are going to move in this space as, as this way. And as we move in this direction, sort of further away from uh, agent B's uh, zero, the origin point, uh, she is getting happier and happier and happier. So as you see, there is a tendency. Um, so these are kind of waves. Uh, agent A would like to get farther away from 
his origin point because she gets happier and happier and happier. So this is her best point, sort of. And then Agent B is pushing those waves, I mean, would like to push those waves to get happier and happier and happier. But, well, it seems like Agent A pushes uh, further makes Agent B worse off because she has to uh, move back, right? Um, but nevertheless, we can talk about mutual gain. It's like, are there win-win situations in this scenario? And there will be. This is exactly what we're going to talk about, mutual gain from trade, and then connect it to proto-efficient allocations. But to some, this is exactly how we drove the Edgeworth Bucks. All you need is the initial endowments for good one and good two. Just add them up, and hence we're going to get the Bucks the sizes of which are depending on the initial endowments. Then I drove the edge word box, put agent A here, agent B here, and then given the utility functions, I can draw the agents in different curves. All right, um, that's it.